Hello everyone and welcome back to my six part series all about teaching English online with italki. This series is very much aimed at those of you who are new teachers on italki. Maybe you're considering becoming a digital nomad or working remotely, working online, traveling full time and earning money while you do so, which is what I do. Now, if you are new to this series or channel, I would recommend checking out the playlist up above in the card. You can also find the link in the description below. And why not consider subscribing? That way you can capture any videos I do on this subject going forward. Now, this is episode four. We've talked about availability, scheduling, pricing and trial lessons. This video is going to be probably the most meaty of the ones so far. So I would suggest maybe getting your phone or getting a bit of paper and writing some notes as you go along. We're going to be talking about actually doing a lesson and planning for a lesson more importantly in terms of the material that you may send a student beforehand. The first thing that I'm going to talk about is one word and that is bespoke. Okay, students when they come to our talkie are all different. Okay, there isn't any one way in which you can teach every single student because everyone will have different needs and motivations. So always have that word bespoke in the back of your head because it's not a case that you can just send the same material to 20 students that you have in a week and expect that lesson to be productive and for the student to get the most out of it. Secondly, the thing that you need to be clear on with italki is that the majority of students, and this isn't always the case, are not looking for a strict teacher classroom environment with a textbook. They don't want textbooks, they don't want exercises. Pro the primary reason they've come to italki is, is to have a conversation with a native English speaker or whatever language you are teaching. You know, it's a huge misconception and I, I think that if you're coming to italki to be like a strict teacher in a classroom, just doing exercises on grammar from a textbook, italki is not for you because it's all about speaking and listening primarily. So let's start off looking at speaking. One thing that I have done which has really helped me out over the last year is to set up one document which is full of conversation topics that you can potentially use in lessons. I've called it the ultimate conversation document which I can send to you if you like. Just send me an email. My email is in the description of all of my videos. It's very easy to find. And you can start off by looking at general topics. So talk about things like family, work, travel, positives and negatives of hometowns, things like that. And it doesn't really matter if that student is a beginner, intermediate, advanced, because you as the teacher can tailor the conversation dependent on that student's level. So you can use more complicated vocabulary, more complex constructions, things like that, more complex grammar. But obviously with a beginner student, you potentially wouldn't do that. One thing I normally do with this is I will send it to students as well in a first lesson to give them a, a bit of an idea of, a, of what is potentially to come in terms of speaking practice. I will normally send them a message a couple of days later on Skype with a suggestion of what we might want to talk about in relation to that document. So they can just look on the document, look at the subjects and have a bit of a think about, you know, oh, what could I potentially talk about in the lesson. The thing about conversation with a student is that some of them may prefer a lesson to be quite structured in terms of, you know, we'll talk about this subject for the first half, we'll then talk about the other subject for the second half. However, that's not always the case. So particularly with more advanced students, which we're going to come on to in another video, planning a lesson might not always be the best thing to do because actually with an advanced student, there isn't always a lot you can recommend in terms of grammar and corrections and correcting errors, that kind of thing they may prefer to simply have a natural conversation about what they've done in the week or you know what's happening at work or something that you've talked about before they might want to talk about further. And that might be slightly nerve wracking for you as a teacher because you're kind of going in blind. However, it's what the student wants. That's their desires to become more confident with natural conversation. And so planning something isn't always the best decision to make. When you're focusing on speaking and conversation, it's very important that you are being conscious of any errors that that student makes, no matter how minor it may be. Sometimes if someone is a more beginner level, you're obviously not going to point out every single tiny error that they make because there will probably be thousands. However, for a more advanced student, pointing out errors, no matter how small, is so important, particularly with things like prepositions and articles. 
That's what I found from the last year of teaching online. So, you know, always be typing while you're doing a lesson. That's the key thing with a speaking lesson. You know, suggest vocabulary, recommend other ways of saying things. If they're messing up modal verbs or conjunctions, things like that, highlight that in the text on the Skype chat so they can go back afterwards and just look at what you've talked about and hopefully it will stay in their brain for next time. The next point to talk about in relation to my ultimate conversation document also is relating to speaking in terms of IELTS. So many students, particularly in Russia, I'm finding, will be looking to gain an IELTS certification, which will enable them to study or work in an English speaking country, for example, the UK, US, Canada or Australia. And in general, a lot of the IELTS conversations that you will have will be very much similar to what I talked about already in terms of general conversation. However, some students may want you to structure a lesson as they would experience in an IELTS exam. So for speaking part two, they would need that bit of time to prepare before they start talking about something. However, alternatively, they may just simply want to have a discussion about various topics which may come up in an IELTS exam. Let's move on to listening, which in my opinion comes hand in hand with speaking. One of the things about teaching online is that you may feel that you, you need to have the student speaking all the time. And yeah, that's a benefit for them to speak as much as possible, but it's also about listening and their comprehension of a native speaker when they are actually speaking. So don't be afraid of, you know, when you're talking, sometimes you think, oh, am I speaking too much? And yeah, sometimes that might be the case, but don't be afraid of expressing your opinion because it adds more to a conversation and, and actually they get so much out of listening to a native speaker speaking in terms of their understanding. And you know, some things I do with listening in particular are look at videos. So you could potentially send them a link to a YouTube video. I have a YouTube channel, so many of my students use my YouTube videos, the travel ones, to listen to how a native speaker speaks on an everyday basis and then talk about their comprehension of that video, their understanding of it, anything, anything that they didn't fully understand, you can clarify. Other things you can do with listening in terms of encouraging them to listen more are doing things in their spare time. So watching movies, TV shows in English, watching things like TED Talks. Robert Proctor is great. Search him on YouTube. They do fantastic talks in a variety of accents with a transcript in any language. So it's an perfect opportunity for someone to do some listening, go back and check what they've looked at and see if they understand it. Another thing with TV shows and YouTube is about subtitles. So encourage someone to watch it first without subtitles and see how much they understand, then watch it again with subtitles and then they can measure whether they were successful in understanding everything. Next up, we're gonna have a look at pronunciation, which is probably my favorite part of teaching English online on italki, particularly with Cantonese and Mandarin speakers based in China, Hong Kong and Taiwan because they have a notorious difficulty when it comes to particular vowel sounds, consonant sounds, etc. in particularly British English. And one of the things that I want to talk about with pronunciation is that it's not just about speaking, it's also about listening. So one of the things that I do, especially in relation to British English, is maybe spend a couple of lessons just talking about various aspects of British English. So things like the schwa sound, diphthongs, monothongs, glottal stop, glottal stop, the dark L, football, not football, and also various accents, especially if that student is interested in learning about those accents like the RP accent, like the Queen, or Cockney, as I said, or my normal accent, which is estuary English. I love doing accents, by the way. And, you know, the thing that you need to stress with this is that you're not teaching someone to speak with a Cockney accent. You're teaching someone to recognise things in someone else's speech when they're listening. So pronunciation and listening are very much connected. Something else that I look at with pronunciation is in relation to reading. So find an article or an ebook or something like that that is relevant to that student's interest that you would have captured in your trial lesson earlier. And, you know, you can then read through that article or whatever in a lesson together. So you may want to allow the student to read a paragraph first and look at their intonation, look at their word stress, look at their use of the schwa sound, etc. And then give them feedback afterwards. You may want to then read the, that paragraph yourself so they can see how a native speaker would pronounce every word in that paragraph. Or you may want to do it the other way around or alternate it through an article where you read a paragraph first yourself, 
giving the opportunity to the student to mimic exactly what you've done. And you know what? I've found that doing it this way has really generated some great results with people's pronunciation because particularly around schwa sounds and, you know, diphthongs and monothongs, like, you know, the R sound, which is very common in British English, like in the words dance, grass, bath, path, you know, most people will say dance, path, grass. That's just an example. And, you know, by doing that kind of exercise, it can really help someone's pronunciation. And moving on to reading and writing, to be honest with you, something like reading is something that a student will do in their own time. Spending time focusing on reading in a lesson, unless it's to do with pronunciation, as I mentioned, isn't so productive in my mind. It might be for some people. So you might want to read a text and similarly with pronunciation, read a paragraph at a time and, and encourage the student to then talk about their comprehension and summarize what's happened in that paragraph. It's also a fantastic way of broadening someone's vocabulary. With writing, one thing that I absolutely love doing is using Google Docs. So if, for example, you're doing a business English lesson all about writing a formal or informal email, for example, you can set up a shared Google Docs document and write that email together on the screen and you can see exactly what's happening on that document and it's fantastic because you can do it in real time and you can correct and advise while you're doing it another thing with writing that you may want to do if you know that student isn't so comfortable doing it that first way is allow them to write something for you before send it to you beforehand perhaps you may want to correct it before a lesson a bit like proofreading and then go through it in the lesson or you may want to do it in the lesson itself in terms of correcting it's up to you and it's up to what the student wants. But in terms of writing, that's what I like to do. To be honest, it's normally relating to business English when it comes to writing because people do have issues writing emails. Using phrasal verbs in written English is a huge issue. So um, yeah, that's writing and reading. Lovely. So to summarise, I think you've probably realised from the whole of this lesson that the key to having a successful, productive lesson is planning. Not in all cases. As I said, in some cases, you might not need to plan anything, but that might be right for a student. As I said, bespoke. Every student is different and every level of planning and the content of each lesson needs to be different. The other thing that I will say that is so important is about motivation and encouragement. You know, if you're just ending a lesson and saying, okay, we're done, bye. What is that doing? It, it's not encouraging or motivating a student. So, you know, highlight some of the points that they have focused on in the lesson and, you know, Oh, you did really well today with your flowing speech. Your, your speech was very flowing. You made very few mistakes in relation to articles, which you may have spoken about before. Things like that, you know, give them something to go away with to encourage them to continue their language learning journey. And, you know, they're likely to book another lesson with you. Obviously, it has to be genuine, you know, be honest. You know, if they haven't done particularly well in a lesson, don't be, don't be scared to say, you know, okay, I think we need to try this again next time because we haven't seen the progression that I was hoping for. And that's fine, you know, I think students really appreciate honesty. They are humans, just like you, you know, and treat them like that. You're on the same level. Be natural and be relaxed. That is the, the key for me, you know. Don't be a strict teacher, don't have textbooks and don't use exercises because they can do all of that in their own time. There's so much more that I could talk about in relation to material, lesson planning and actually doing a lesson. I would probably be here all day if I was to talk about that, but I've tried to put together some things today based on my experience that have really helped me. You know, I hope this helps you when you are doing lessons. It can be so nerve wracking as a teacher, especially when you first start, or if you have a student that is particularly, you know, overpowering and intimidating. I've had that a few times, but you know, you just have to learn from experience and remember that everyone is different. I cannot say that enough. So thanks for watching, I hope this has helped. Don't forget to leave your comments down below about your experience with lessons and planning lessons. Do you do anything different to me? That would be great if you could add to the conversation because as I said, I could be here all day if I kept talking. So we're moving on now to videos five and six, which are all about advanced students and any problems you might have as an iTalkie teacher. Thanks for watching.